So about five months or so ago, someone reached out to me wanting a commission build of something called a frog pad. Now what the frog pad was, if you're not aware, is it was a single handed keyboard. So if you want to use a mouse in one hand and a keyboard in the other, or if you had like a disability where you couldn't use both hands, you had full functionality on a keyboard on one of your hands. But it was discontinued, so they commissioned me to build it, and I ended up building them a wireless one with ZMK. But what I also thought at the time that'd be really cool for the board is to make it into a gaming macro pad because it has basically the perfect layout for this. So today we're gonna be building the Scotto Frog, which is a 20 key gaming macro pad, or if you build a wireless one, it's a single handed keyboard. We're just gonna dive right in. So let's first start by looking at the case here. I just wanna bring attention to this texture I have on here, which is the fuzzy skin setting inside Akira. This is something I've started doing with a lot of my boards and especially the keycaps, which I'll show you later in this video. It just kind of hides the layer lines really nicely. And if you see here, this is a matte filament. So it really hides them nicely. and kind of gives it this nice like concrete texture with this filament that I'm using. And it's just a really nice way to do boards. But then of course we also have the plate here. I have the textured finish. And as you can see, it's just a 20 key little macro pad with three 2U keys. These are all 1U and then these are 1.5U right here. I did 3D print the keycaps, which I'll show you later in this video. But the first thing we have to do is get the switches installed. So I'm gonna be using Aco Crystal Silver switches and this video isn't sponsored by them, but they did send me these for free. But if you've seen any of my other videos, you know I'm a big fan of Aco switches because they're pretty affordable and they get to you pretty quick because they're available on Amazon. The reason I chose these switches in particular is that if I hold one up here, you could see when I press the switch here down, you can see it doesn't really fully go into the housing there. And that's because these only have a three millimeter total travel and then one millimeter actuation point. Now, the reason I chose these for this build is that for a gaming board, that's really good because they're gonna actuate within one millimeter where normally it's like 1.6 to like 2.2 is where a switch will actuate. So they're really, really fast for gaming. Now a typing experience on these isn't the best because they kind of bottom out fast. As you can see, they kind of have like that clacky sound when you bottom them out. So typing's a little bit too short, but you can type with them, of course. I'm just a fan of longer switches for those. But that's what I'm gonna be using. I'm gonna just be using the Echo Crystal Silver. So I'm just gonna grab my plate here really quick, and you can see that we're gonna be using stabilizers, specifically Durac V2 plate mounts. But an issue that people often have with these 3D printed plates here is that the tolerances can be hard. You can only get them tuned so well with your printer. And the issue is that they'll often bind. But a solution to that is if you use something like this called a deburring tool, you can actually run it around the edges of the plate cutout here and remove that elephant's foot to make the stabilizer fit a lot better within the plate cutout. I already did that before this video, but I also did want to mention too, that you can see that I have a three millimeter thick plate here, but I also have like these lips on it so that these switches will click in, which is another nice little thing there. So I'm just going to install the switches really fast. And I'll be back in a moment. As you can see, we have the switches and the stabilizers on the plate. And what I like to do before moving forward with any soldering step is just confirm that my stabilized keys are working as they should. So what I do for that is I just grab my plate, I grab a stabilized key like so, and I pop it onto a stabilized switch. I just make sure that there is no binding. And as you can see, that's not binding. If it was binding, it would kind of get stuck halfway like that. So at this point, I'm pretty confident that the plate is good. And I can move on to the first soldering step, which are the columns. There's all the columns wired up. And as you can see, I have these nice little bends on these wires, so they just kind of route perfectly. Now I'm ready to move on to the diodes for the rows. But before that, I wanted to talk a little bit about a tool that I recently made, and it is available for free on the repo if you want to build it yourself, or you can just get one on my website if you don't want to build it yourself, you just buy one there. But it's a tool for coiling diodes super consistently, and it helps make your builds really, really clean. So this is the two-part tool. You can see this is the bottom half with that recessed section, and then this wire will basically just sit in there, and you can spin it around so you can kind of do one of those. But what I'm going to do is I want to first talk about how a diode goes because this is very commonly messed up on these hand wire boards. And basically, if we look at a diode here that's been coiled already, you can see it has a black line and then it has the coiled half. Basically, that black line should always face the row. So if we have a row here, imagine this is the row up top, that black line should be facing that. This is going to be really hard to show you because it's really small, but you put it in there and I like to just put it right where it bottoms out on the bottom there. And you just kind of bend it once like so. So you can see that that is sitting on there. And you take this top part, you put it on top, and you basically just spin the diode around a few times. I like to do about three turns, and you can see that that gets a very nice consistent coil. Then all you can do is just pull it off. You can cut off that excess right there, but you get very consistent coiled diodes that if you take a switch here, keep in mind that this little tail here will be actually cut off normally, but that will sit on there just like so. So you can see that that very consistently sits on there and it makes your build just a lot cleaner. So I'm gonna go through and do all my diodes now.
after there's all the diodes prepared, I'm gonna go through now and start doing the rows, but I first wanna do just this main row first, and then I'll talk in a second about heat shrink tubing. But I always like to start with the top row because basically these have intersections that need heat shrink, the top one doesn't. So it's a really quick one to just kind of do first, and then you can go through the other ones that need a little bit more work. <laughs> So as you can see, they're all wired up here. And what I wanted to mention really quick is that you probably saw me using this, which is just a magnet and basically just helps me keep all my trimming clean. So they're not flying all over. So just a quick tip there. But what I have to do at this point is start doing the intersection rows, which if we just take our copper wire here and put it on there, you'll see that there are these intersections in between each column and row. Obviously that will cause a short if we left that like that. So what I do is I take it, I put these on there and then I take a paint marker and I mark the intersection. So we have one here, one here, 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 and then this last one I don't need to worry about because I'm gonna actually just trim that off because you can see that the diode's gonna run from here to there, so there really isn't any reason to insulate that one. What I do once I have those little markings on here is I can actually take heat shrink tubing. I'm actually using this new like marine heat shrink, which basically has hot glue in it, so when you seal it down, it will glue it in place and hold it, and if you're using on like a marine application, it will obviously keep water out, that's why it's marine heat shrink. But that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take this and do it for the rest of the rows, and we'll be back in a moment when I'm ready to wire up the controller. So there's the entire matrix. And at this point, I'm ready to start wiring everything to the controller, which for this one, I'm just gonna be using an Arduino Pro Micro with a USB-C port. Now on my website, if you're not aware, all my hand wire boards are actually available for free if you wanna download and build them yourself. But I also recently updated all the blog posts on there to feature really nice diagrams to tell you where which column and row should go to what pin on the controller. But at this point, I'm just gonna wire this up and I'll be back in a second when we're ready to assemble the case. There's everything all wired up now. I already flashed the firmware on this too, so I did confirm that it is working. I'm gonna hot glue the controller into this portion of the case right here. And then we'll be back in a second because I wanna show you the keycaps that are really, really cool for this board. So there's the assembled board without the keycaps. You can see it has the nice fuzzy skin on it. And then I'm using these recessed screws on the back, which look really nice because they're flat with some little rubber feet there. But what I'm ready to show you now are the keycaps because that's kind of what's gonna tie this entire board together. And these are them here. They're just 3D printed in the same exact filament as this, which I do have to talk about that this is a matte filament. And if I just pull up one here, that's just a scrap keycap. You can see if I push on this, that these will break pretty easily. And that's not because the stems are super weak, it's mostly because I'm using this matte filament. But if we open these up here and take a look at them, you'll see that they have that fuzzy skin on them still, and they look pretty good. They're using these square stems so they actually fit properly. It's a little bit of a challenge to get them thick enough so that they don't break. You can see they look nice, and I'm just gonna install those really quick, and you'll see this board kinda comes together now. So there's the fully completed board with the matte keycaps. You can see that it matches really, really nicely with the fuzzy skin to the fuzzy skin on the case. Now, I don't know what I'm gonna do for spacebar because I might actually use this one or I might use this one. I'll have to decide when I use it. I'm kind of more used to this for my ortholinear stuff, but that's kind of a little more comfortable there. So I'll have to figure that out. I did earlier say I think that this is running vile, so I'll be able to configure that in firmware without having to actually code anything. So very easily be able to remap stuff on this, which will be nice. But yeah, that's the Scotto Frog build. I think it looks really cool. I'm really happy with how the case came out. I was actually gonna use this case originally, which has thinner walls, as you can see. And I don't think that would look as cool as this one with the wider walls. I think it just looks a little bit better. But I don't really have anything else to show you here. I can't really do a typing test on this. I mean, I can kind of do that, I guess. That's, it sounds good, it feels good. I think it'll be good for gaming. I think I did mention that this is available for free if you wanna build it yourself. So you can go to the description and find all the files for it. And yeah, I don't really have much else to say here. So if you did enjoy this, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.